Hello there and welcome to Friendship Alliance Church. Uh, Go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6. Uh, Don't get too comfortable there though. Uh, We're going to highlight some other verses along the way as we can continue this series that we started last week called Fourfold Christmas. We are looking at the four distinct definitions, uh, descriptions that the prophet Isaiah gives to the coming Messiah more than 700 years before his birth. So we're going to continue on this theme. Uh, Before we go any further though, I just want to give you a heads up that at the end of the message today, we're going to observe communion together. So if you want to take part in that, I just wanted to let you know ahead of time. But let's look at these verses once again in Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6. For unto us a child is born, a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And last week we looked at Pele Yehetz, which in Hebrew means Wonderful Counselor. And today we're going to look at El Gabor, which means Mighty God. That's what we're going to be looking at today. Jesus was, is, and always will be Mighty God. Amen? Christ alone. Christ and Christ alone has has the might, has the power to fully embody all of these different descriptions that are given to him. Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Uh, One of my favorite uh, songs from this past year uh, was a song by Crowder. Uh, He did a a song called Good God Almighty. Uh, Put it in the chat if you've heard this song before. It's a great song. Check it out. I'll put the link in the video description, but uh, the song says, He is good, He is God, He is good God Almighty. And that's what we're going to be looking at today. We're going to be looking at God Almighty today. And just like last week, we're going to look at His name, look at this name given to Him, Mighty God, and we're going to look at it in further detail. But before we go any further along today, would you join me in a word of prayer? Father, we thank you so much for this time where we can be gathered together in a spirit of unity. And I pray that you would use this time to strengthen our our knowledge of you, Father, uh, to strengthen our relationship with you, Lord, and to empower us with your word, that your word be living and active in each of our lives today. Uh, We thank you once again for for all that you're doing in our lives. I pray that, once again, this word would come alive in in every area of our lives, Lord. And we thank you, praise you once again for all that you are. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. So we're going to be looking at God Almighty today, that Jesus is mighty God. And the first word I want to look at with you is mighty. And we're going to look at all the different ways, or I should say some of the different ways, in which Jesus truly is mighty. I want to highlight some of them with you today. And the first one, the first one I want to share with you, and one of the reasons why Jesus is mighty, is because he is the great mediator. Amen? Jesus is the great mediator. First verse I want you to write down, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 5 through 6. For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Jesus Christ, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. That Jesus is the only way to be reconciled to God. He restores that relationship. He is the the great mediator. That takes might. That takes power. Amen? Jesus tells us in John chapter 14, verse 6, that Jesus answers. He says, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life, that no one comes to the Father except through me. Amen? He is truly that that bridge between us and God. He is that great mediator. He is that perfect bridge. And as I was researching and preparing for this message, I I started going down a rabbit hole uh, of looking at the the world's most messed up bridges, uh, whether it be from architecture flaws to just flaws in general, like there were some that were built on a fault line to some that were these really narrow bridges that were pretty much built in the middle of a wind tunnel and people were getting knocked off of them. All these bridges that had all all these problems with them. And there was this one bridge that I came across and I'll post a picture here. This is the Borovsko Bridge in the Czech Republic. 
And this bridge, it was originally started in the 1930s, but construction suddenly stopped due to uh, money problems, but most specifically because of war that was uh, all over the place during that time. And so uh, it was left mostly finished. And, and in the end, the, the road that it was supposed to attach to was never finished. So it had nowhere to go. It's this, it never came to fruition. The, the bridge was completely abandoned and left leading to absolutely nowhere unless you count the middle of this drinking reservoir where this bridge now resides. It's truly this bridge to nowhere. And I remember, you know, I, I've grown up in church, you know, most of my life. And I remember seeing this illustration as a kid and even in adult church. And, and maybe you've seen it too if you've gone to church before. And it's this illustration uh, that shows, shows humanity and it shows God on one side. And there's this great hole, this great chasm, this great canyon, or whatever you want to call it that's in the middle. And, and we simply cannot get to God. Com humanity cannot get to God. And so what happens is that the cross comes. The cross comes in this illustration and it becomes that perfect bridge. We, we gain access to God through Jesus Christ, through his sacrifice. And it was, uh, it, it was to show that. And I remember Jesus being that perfect bridge for humanity. And then, but when I look around the world today, I, I see so many bridges that lead to nowhere, like the Brahovsko Bridge. I, I see humanity trying to build bridges through, through good works alone, trying to gain access to God by good works alone. Or humanity believing that, that all faiths, uh, all faiths uh, being able to be that bridge to God. Well, just believe in something, it'll be that bridge to God. No. That, that Jesus is the one true bridge. He, he is the great mediator. Amen. That though he is the way, the truth, and the life, he is mighty God. He is that great mediator. And he is also mighty to save. Amen. That Jesus is mighty to save. John 3, 17 says that God did not send his son to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. And Jesus tells us in Luke chapter 19, verse 10, he says, For the Son of Man, I came to seek and to save that which was lost. That takes power. That takes might. Amen. That Jesus is mighty to save. And you know me, for those of you who watch, my mind always goes to song. And uh, I was thinking of that song, Mighty to Save. Is any, does anyone remember the song, Mighty to Save? I don't know if we've ever sang it here since I've been here. But uh, you know that song, My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save. You know, that song. But anyway, uh, I want to keep my viewers going here. But <laughs> anyway, uh, there is this, uh, uh, this woman. Her name is Laura Story. She is a songwriter. She is a worship leader. And she's a Grammy Award winner. That, that's, that'd be a pretty cool thing to put on your resume, right? I'm a worship leader and I've won a Grammy too. Like it's a pr pretty cool thing to put on your resume. But any, anyway, she was reflecting on this song, Mighty to Save. And she says this, that each time I sing that song, God brings to, to my mind new implications of this verse. And, and the verse that she is referring to is Zephaniah chapter 3. Verse 17, it says this, The Lord your God is with you, the mighty warrior who saves. He will take great delight in you. In his love, you will, he will no longer rebuke you, but he will rejoice over you with singing. And she went on to say that each time, I, each time I sing that song, I get a little lump in my throat when I consider that by his might, God saved me. That it's hard to fathom why God, who, who is able to move mountains, would choose to focus his strength on redeeming the very souls that have so deeply offended him. But that is the gospel, she says, that though we have done nothing to merit his favor, God, full of mercy, full of grace, sent his one and only son, Jesus, to pay the debt that we can never pay. He is truly, she says, mighty to Save. And we see this in his word time and time again, don't we, church, that he is mighty to save. And he is also mighty to heal. Amen. He has a power and a might like no other because he has the power to heal. He is mighty to heal.
In Matthew chapter 8, verses 16 through 17, it says this, When when evening came, many who were demon-possessed were brought to him, and he drove out the spirits with a word, and he healed all who were sick. And this was to fulfill, it says, what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. He took up our infirmities, and he bore our diseases. And it is referring to Isaiah chapter 53, verse 5, where it says this, He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. Jesus is mighty to heal, physically, mentally, spiritually. A lot of times we think of healer, we, our minds automatically go to the, to the physical realm, but just think of the, the spiritual ramifications of what being said here. In Isaiah 53, he was pierced for our transgressions, our our sins. He was crushed for our iniquities, the things that we have done wrong. But by his wounds, it says, we are healed. Jesus is mighty to heal, and he heals in a number of different ways. Amen? Physically, mentally, and spiritually. He is mighty to heal, and he is mighty to love. His, his love has a, has a power and a might to it like no other. But don't take my word for it. Let, let me share this with you in Romans chapter 8, verses 38 through 39. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels nor demons, neither present nor future, nor any power, any power, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That is a mighty love. No other power can get in the way of that. Nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Not our mess-ups, not our faults, not our, not our failures, not our shortcomings, not our bad habits, not our bad breath. I just put that last one in there to make sure you're paying attention. Nothing, nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. He is mighty to love, and nothing can separate us from that love. Here's another one. Here's another great one about how mighty Jesus is. Think, think, just try to wrap your head around this one, is that he has conquered sin, hell, and the grave. Amen? That's how mighty he is. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 57, but thanks be to God, he gives us victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus. Jesus Christ. That is true might. That is a power like no other. It's it's hard to even wrap our heads around that. He gives us victory over sin and death, and it is all because of Christ Jesus our Lord, because he is mighty, because he has conquered sin, hell, and the grave. And that is why, believers, we can say, where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? Because our God is a mighty God. Amen. And let me share one more with you here on the reasons why Jesus is mighty. And it is one that we have not experienced yet. And that is his return will be mighty. Amen. His return will be a display of power and might like no other. Luke 21 verses 27 through 28 and Jesus is describing the, the, the signs of the times. And he says, At that time you will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with great power and great glory. Think of the, I, I can't even begin to imagine what that's going to look like. And then he says this, When you see these things begin to take place, stand up, lift up your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. That his return will be a display of his might, of his power. Jesus truly is mighty. Amen? But as we see in this description in Isaiah, that Jesus is also God. He is mighty and he is God. He is mighty God. Amen? But let's look at this definition then of of the reason why Jesus is God in, in the beginning of the book of John. It says this, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was light to all mankind. That light shines in the darkness, and the darkness cannot overcome it because our God is a mighty God. Amen? But then it goes along to say in verse 14, it says, The Word, talking about Jesus here, The Word became flesh 
and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. And then we see later, Jesus says plain and simply in John chapter 10, verse 30, I and the Father are one. Jesus was and is God, fully God. God in all of his wisdom, his power, his might. God in his infinite goodness and grace and mercy. The, the God who has neither, neither a beginning or an end. The God who created the universe with a billion galaxies and over a billion stars in those galaxies who now sustains all creation by his power. Jesus is truly God and God Almighty. And, and the way that John is wording it here in the beginning of John chapter 1, it is a, a straightforward declaration of Christ's deity. Since John is using the word, word here to describe Jesus. In the beginning was the word and the word was God. Jesus is God. And here, here's the thing. Here's one of the most, I, I think, astonishing aspects of Jesus that I, that I believe is overlooked. And that is this, is that Jesus is God. Jesus is fully God, fully man, fully God. And yet, Jesus is not out of touch with humanity. Like Jesus, mighty Jesus, the name above all names, exalted Jesus, is still Emmanuel, God with us, and he made his dwelling among us, as it tells us in John 1, verse 14. It, 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 just, it blows my mind. Because when you think about it, think of all the, all the politicians, all the, the CEOs, the people on earth here with great wealth and great authority. And, and so many of them have become so out of touch with the world around them. Like I, I think of these politicians, I'm like, there's no way that you live in the same planet as us, right? I just think about that. Like, like Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk, like they, they gotta be from Mars, right? Like they're, they're, just, they're so out of touch with the real world. And uh, I remember I worked, at, uh, I worked at Blockbuster for a number of years and I, I was just thinking of how out of touch the CEO was first when he said that, uh, that their business model was recession proof and uh, good luck finding a blockbuster today, by the way. But uh, also, I remember when they were trying to compete with Netflix and exchange uh, with the uh, movies sent directly to your home, like you order movies online, send them to your home. But anyway, uh, they had this program where you would uh, get, a, get a movie online sent to your home and then you could go to any blockbuster store and trade that in for a free movie. And so we were trading in online movies left and right, and we weren't renting any, like we weren't receiving any money for them. It was just all free exchanges in the store. And I remember I was working, uh, I was at this big meeting with and like the, the top people of the company were there and all these managers were there. And one bold manager, man, God bless you, but there's this one bold manager who asked, I, I don't know if it was the CEO, but it was definitely one of the top two or three people in the company. And they asked that person, okay, if people are just coming in and trading in movies for free, how are the stores supposed to make any money? And there was this really awkward pause. One, I, they, I don't think they could believe that the person built up the nerve to ask that question. And two, they didn't have an answer. Like they were so out of touch with their business. Like all they cared about was the bottom line and, and beating Netflix that they just totally overlooked the fact that stores aren't making any money by just trading these movies in all day long and that's all we did. And so I just think about so how out of touch like that CEO was with, with his business, with, with what was going on, right? But, but that's the most astonishing aspect of Jesus, isn't it? That, that he is truly exalted. He is the name above all names and yet he made his dwelling among us. That, that God exalted Jesus to the highest place, gave him the name that is above all names. At the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, every tongue should confess on heaven and on earth that, that Jesus Christ is Lord. And all those things are just the exalted nature of Jesus. And yet he made his dwelling among us. He is not out of touch with humanity. It just blows my mind. He is, he is mighty 
and, and yet he made his dwelling among us. He is, he is good God Almighty, amen? And yet he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. He truly is mighty God, amen? Let's look at these terms together, a mighty God. It is Jesus and Jesus alone who can fully encompass that, that name given to him of mighty God, amen? And as I was preparing this message, I came across this, uh, this article called The Paradox of God, and I found it to be so interesting. And I'm gonna share a little bit of this, uh, this excerpt with you, but in the meantime, as I'm sharing this, I, I want you to think about just the, the mighty nature of God and, and how Jesus truly is mighty God. See, see if this lives up to the description here as I read this. He came into his own, and his own received him not. The loftiest, most exalted became the embodiment of humility and simplicity. The richest became the poorest that the poor might become rich. He, he feasted with sinners that they might not starve in their sin. He starved for 40 days in the wilderness that we might feast on the impeccable bread of life. He taught us how to love our enemies, to do good to those who treat us badly. He emptied himself that we might be filled. The lion became the lamb and that sheep might become shepherds. His heart was broken so that he might bind up the brokenhearted. His body was crushed that we might be made whole. We came into the world to live. He came into the world to die. The Lord of Lords became a lowly servant to serve the needs of mankind. The man of sorrows, acquainted with the depths of grief, became the joy to the world. He was rejected so that we might be accepted. He was bruised so that we might be healed. He was condemned so that we might be justified. He was judged so that we would not be judged. He died as the innocent one that, was, uh, that the guilty might be declared innocent. By grasping life, we die. Through death, we find life. Glory to the Lamb, the paradox of God. He truly is a, a mighty God in a number of different ways, church. Amen. And how we're going to close our time together is by observing and by remembering what the mighty God has done for you and for me. His body was broken. The mighty God, his body was broken. His blood was shed so that he could be that perfect bridge of reconciliation between us and God. Amen. I'm going to read from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, starting in verse, 30, uh, in verse 23 as we observe communion together. For I received from the Lord what I passed on to you. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us partake together. Going on to verse 25. In the same way after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me, for whenever you eat this bread or drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death again until he comes. Let us partake together. Amen. Would you join me as we go before the Lord in prayer? Father, you are, you are good. You are God. You are good God Almighty. And we lift you up today. We exalt you. You are the one and only true mighty God. You are mighty in a number of ways which we've looked at in your word today. And you truly are God, God, fully God and fully man, who, who made your, you, you dwelled among us. Although you were exalted, the name above all names, you still humbled, you humbled yourself by dwelling among us, Father. We give you all the praise and we give you all the glory for that, Lord, for all that you are. For we give you all the praise for this Christmas season. May, the, may we not forget you in the busyness and, and all the craziness of the Christmas season. May we truly take the time to be focused on you, our wonderful counselor, our mighty God, our everlasting Father, our Prince of Peace. We give you all the praise. We give you all the glory. And all God's people said, 
Amen. Amen. I love you so much, Friendship Alliance Church. Thank you so much for tuning in today and being a part of Church Online. Uh, there's lots of different ways that you can connect with us. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, uh, YouTube. Uh, be sure to check out our website. There you'll see updates, uh, ways to do your tithe and offering by clicking on the giving link. Uh, also, if you go to our website and click on weekly messages, you'll see this video of today's message along with a section called Deep and Wide uh, Follow-Up Questions to Today's Message. We encourage you to check them out as an individual, as a small group. Uh, like we always say, we don't, we don't believe that church online should just be a consumed experience, but a shared experience. I want to encourage you to ask yourself the question, who am I going to share this good word with today? Who am I going to spur uh, along towards love and good deeds? So we encourage you to do that here at Friendship Alliance Church. And uh, we're just so excited that you're a part of this church family. Uh, one more thing I want to mention, uh, Christmas Eve, if you live in the area, we're going to have a Christmas Eve service here at 6 p.m. Uh, there will not be a, a church service, an official church service on Christmas Day. There might be some people uh, that gather here, but there won't be a recording on Christmas Day either, so I want to make you aware of that. Uh, hopefully, we'll post something on Christmas Eve. Uh, once we get some more details on that, we will let you know. Uh, but I love you, church. Have an awesome, have a blessed week. And may God bless you.